microphone on here. Yeah. Okay. Let's just get comfortable. Okay. And whatever you want. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I need to put my glasses on so I can okay. see what I'm doing here. <laughs> so if we could start first by just having you say your name and then spell your name for us. Okay. My name is William H. Rickard, Jr. W-I-L-L-I-A-M-H-R-I-C-K-A-R-D, Jr., J-R, period. All right, thank you. Uh, and my name is Robert Bauman. Today's date is December 4th of 2013. And we are conducting this interview on the campus of Washington State University Tri-Cities. So uh, maybe we could start by just having you tell us a little bit about your background, um, where you're from, uh, when you came to Hanford, what brought you here, that sort of okay. thing. Well, I the first, uh, first time that I ever heard the words atomic bomb. I was a rifleman in an infantry company for the Chinese Combat Command in, in a place in China called Chikiang. Hmm. Chikiang was a dirt airstrip. There were about a hundred soldiers there. Our main duty was to guard an ammunition dump at, at an airfield. In August 1945, I'd been in the Army for 15 months. I was 19 years old. The captain called us together and said that the United States Air Force had dropped a bomb in Japan. It was an atomic bomb. Of course, I was extremely glad that the war was over. And it was a few days later, I stood on the same airstrip, and a Japanese airplane flew in. Uh, only, I'd been in the Army for in January, February, and March, and April along the Burma Road in China. And during the stay in Burma, slept on the ground every night, kept my M1 rifle with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I got to China and I got a bed for the first time in four months. So Chikiang duty was pretty soft compared to Burmese duty. And when the war ended, when, the, when they dropped the atomic bomb, I knew I would be going home. Well, they had a a uh, point system in the army. I think you needed 65 points, and you got points for combat experience and so forth. But I was one point short. <laughs> so, guess what? I got assigned to a military police company in Shanghai, China. For six months, I was in an MP in, in Shanghai, which is probably more dangerous <laughs> than my stay at Chikiang. <laughs> but anyway, I finally got home. And like most veterans did, I used the GI Bill to get a degree. I graduated from the University of Colorado in 1950 with a degree in botany. And I got a job at the University of Colorado at that time installing weather stations in the front range. Uh, while I was, had a job, I decided to go s to school some more and, and I wanted to be a, a, a high school teacher. I could hike so I could teach botany and biology. Well, I, I got graduated from Colorado in 1950 and, and got a master's degree in 1953. And then I decided, well, maybe I ought to think of teaching in college. So I, I applied for a, a scholarship, or a research assistant appointment at Pullman. So in 1953, Barbara, my wife, and I went to Pullman. And there I graduated in 1957 with a PhD with Dr. Daubenmeyer. 
the first job I got was a, a, a as assistant professor of biology at New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico. But it was a part-time teaching job. The other part was was a uh, a research field research job at the Nevada test site. And the, the, the purpose of my work at the Nevada test site was to study the impacts of atomic explosions on the on the bot botanical aspects of the Nevada test site, Yucca, Frenchman Flat, and Jackass Flat. I worked there for four years and saw the last above ground explosion, which was a, a uh, during the oper uh, during the operation of uh, uh, Project uh, Hardtack and Plum Bob. It, while I was at the test site, I met uh, Jared Davis, who was working at Hanford. He was uh, in the biology department, and he offered me a job at Hanford. And so I moved to uh, Pul moved to Richland in 1960, and was employed by the General Electric Company. At that time, most of the interest was on developing peaceful uses of atomic energy, and one of these was to use a, a nuclear explosion to dig a harbor at Cape Thompson in Alaska. And part of our, our job there was to get baseline data on the biota of the, uh, of the Arctic and also to uh, measure the, how much radioactivity had already been deposited by the years of nuclear testing by the United States and Russia. Oh. So that was the start of that. And I worked up there for a couple of summers. Mm -hmm. And and I worked with Jerry Davis there, and uh, Wayne Hansen, Don Watson, and Roy Nakatani, and Leo Bustead, and Frank Hungate, Frank was my boss for a while, and uh, Jared Davis was the boss. But uh, my real interest at, at Hanford was, although I did the uptake of radioactivity from soil to plants, I was really interested in perhaps getting a part of the Hanford site set aside as a, as a kind of a research park. I had lots of help from various people that thought this was a good idea particularly Rexford Dobbenmeyer at Pullman mm -hmm. and, and uh, Herb Parker, at, who was the manager of the Hanford Laboratories. We conceived the idea of perhaps establishing Rattlesnake Mountain as a, as a, a research natural area. And with the help of other people, particularly Benton County Commissioner at that time, and the building of the Highway 240 from Richland to Bernita Bridge, that set Rattlesnake Mountain apart from the rest of the site and offers a good excuse to set, the, since the, it was primarily a buffer zone, that, and, and <coughs> that this would be a good place to, uh, to establish a reserve, which eventually turned out to be the Arid Land Ecology Reserve which, by not, which in 2000 was turned over to the Fish and Wildlife Service as a part of the Hampton Reach National Monument. So most of my research activity was done on the ale reserved after, after the, uh, the work we'd done it in Alaska. Okay. And so what sorts of work were you doing on the ale reserve? Well, the first, thing, first project we started on was the impact of cattle grazing on a shrub step. And we did that in conjunction with a, the uh, International Biological Research Program, 
long, yes, International Biological Research Program, which was divided up into various sections of, of one part was grasslands of North America. And the, and the ale reserve is representative of sagebrush steppe vegetation in, in the northwestern United States. There were other sites in New Mexico, uh, Kansas, Colorado, Montana, North and South Dakota. And that lasted for several years. Th then as, as time went on, I got older. And, uh, and uh, most of the work that I did was then associated with environmental impact statements. Uh, even did the first environmental impact statement for what was the whoops plant at that time. The biologic uh, uh, basalt waste isolation pro pro program, and I finally re retired sometime. I don't know, can't remember. I was 65 years old, <laughs> but uh, I, while I was worked for the General Electric Company, I also taught school at at a army barracks down where the. Uh, bus lot is today, and I taught the first class in plant ecology, and among my students over the years was Lester Eberhardt and Dick Fitzner and Dennis Dobble and Brett Tiller, manager, president of environmental, environmental assessment services. So for 30 years, I've taught as an adjunct professor at Washington State University in the Tri-Cities. And where was that located again? That when, you, when you first started teaching in the Army? Uh it was an Army barracks. That was the building that, we was, that was the beginning of the WSU campus. And one of my first students was Les Eberhardt, Dick Fitzner which later were killed in an airplane accident in the Yakima Firing Center. But over the years, many people that worked at Hanford had taken my classes. I want to go back, if we can, to when you, you were talking about your work in New Mexico yes. at the Nevada test site. It's interesting. What sorts of uh, things did you find in your research there? Well. Uh, one of the first things that, uh, when, uh, these were s small explosions, 10 to 40 kiloton range, uh, of maybe up to 100, and they fired them one a week. Hmm. And uh, of course, the, uh, when you watch one of these things uh, from 10, 10 miles away, uh, first thing is, is, is just uh, from a, 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 sh a shot that's on a tower, maybe five or six hundred feet off the ground, first thing you'd see is just a, a, a flash of, of light, and then it, as the ball forms, it's just a, a whole mess of colors, purple, orange, and then it disappears and it and a whole lot of activity, just a massive amount of activity, and, and then things catch on fire. Uh, creosote bush, yucca trees a mile away just ignite like kitchen matches, and then the, then the cloud develops and the big stem and the mushroom cloud, but the vegetation just disappears, it's just cooked. But even after a few summers, vegetation, the surviving vegetation comes back. And the uh, physicists at the uh, test site that made these things, people from uh, Los Alamos and Livermore, about the only thing they noticed that after a year or two after the explosion, that the ground was bare and then it would get green. And that was a big surprise to the physicists, but didn't was quite common to plant ecologists because the plant was Russian thistle. It would blow across the landscape, scatter seeds, 
and the first invading plant was Russian thistle, just like at Hanford, <laughs> where you plow up a field and leave it, what do you get? Russian thistle. And then a whole lot of other plants come in, and in time it would recover. Because most of the radioactivity wasn't at the site, it was gone. <laughs> it went someplace else. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so, um, and then your work in Alaska. Yes. Um, you know, what sorts of things did you find in your research there? Well, the, the main thing there was uh, my colleague Wayne Hansen. He was interested in uh, the uh, food chain of American es Eskimos and the fallout from nuclear weapons tests in the Pacific and Russia and various places. Uh, the northern hemisphere got most of the fallout and in heavy fallout areas with, with rain, like in Arctic Alaska, and the flora there was occupied a great, great part of it was lichens and mosses, which were the food of caribou. Uh, uh, radioactive fallout comes down with rain and snow, and, and if you have a long-lived plant, mm -hmm. it keeps accumulating on the leaves until the leaves drop, and then they hit the ground and decompose, and, and cesium and strontium, which are about a half-life of 30 years, eventually get into the soil and then can recycle. In Alaska, the mosses and lichens, they don't die right away, and they keep c accumulating radionucli radionuclides and builds up mm -hmm. so that it has very high levels of radionuclides as compared to trees that drop their leaves, grasses that die, and the lichens are an important food of caribou in the wintertime, so they accumulate large bur burdens of, of radiocesium, and then the people would, the diet of the, of the America, uh, the American Indians, the Eskimos in Alaska consisted of of uh, caribou, meat, caribou, caribou meat, so that people had higher levels of radiocesium than people in the United States. That be, that's a health physics concern, mm -hmm. which is like Ron Catherine. Right. That's their job. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talked about uh, ale a little bit. Um, and your involvement in, in that. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned a Benton County Commissioner. Do you remember a Benton County Commissioner who? I was don't. Involved? I don't remember his name, but he but he loved wildflowers. And at that time, the uh, county was interested in building a road from Prosser to Bernita Bridge. They wanted to go through. Snively Canyon, but the Department of Energy didn't think that was a good idea. But uh, we had to convince the county that it wasn't a good idea. And the county commissioner, he decided that he ought to side with the Department of Energy. So what was it about um why the desire to create ale, I guess? What was it about well, the area that you thought was... This, uh, the um, desire f to create a, uh, a natural area probably dates back to the days of Theodore Roosevelt, setting apart uh, national forests and national parks. And we have nice national parks in, in the country, uh, Mount Rainier, in Washington and Olympic, all representing mostly forested areas, Rocky Mountain National Park, Yosemite, and but nobody was interested in saving sagebrush, sagebrush grass habitats. This was primarily because sagebrush was not viewed as a useful resource. Uh, in fact, uh, it was a pest, and rangeland managers thought it was a good idea to get rid of it. 
And when the first travelers crossed southern Idaho, they burned it because it would provided fuel, but they hated it because the, it didn't provide any food for their, for their cattle or sheep. So it, it was then regarded as a pest. Mm -hmm. And every Bureau of Land Management started campaigns to get rid of it. But before you got rid of it, we had to understand if it had any good. But this was a tough sell. You're not going to sell this that that uh, keeping it has has any benefits. But it, it's also wise if you have a resource that, that you can destroy it, or at least you ought to understand how it works. It's been here a long time, and learn the mechanics that has has enabled it to stay this way. And the biggest threat. To the to the shrub step was people. If you it uh, when Lewis and Clark came here, there were several resources in Washington State that people could use right away. One was the fish, one was the forest, the other was grass. So it's no surprise our f first white people in Washington used the grass. They brought in cattle and sheep. Then came the magnificent discovery of the plow, that now you can plow up this stuff and raise crops. <coughs> you could even raise more crops with irrigation. So it started to disappear. Half the sagebrush step in Washington disappeared by 1914. So this resource was getting smaller and smaller. So at least some of the people think that, well, maybe we ought not get rid, of, get rid of it all. And the Hanford site was an unusual opportunity to do, to do this because people had, who were farming were moved. This is the first time in history that it, a productive cultivated land was converted to a lower use instead of a higher use. Higher uses are are urban areas, uh, places like Hanford, uh, industry. Lower uses are cattle grazing, but the highest use of all is probably research and education. So here we have an opportunity where we had towns completely destroyed, abandoned fields, abandoned productive fields that are now allowed to go un to re revegetate by themselves and they have for the last 70 years it's been slowly changing back to to what it would be but it's been impeded by a lot of alien species that came with agriculture and among these are cheat grass <laughs> Russian thistle and others, so so it's it's important to uh, to have a place where you can just monitor the changes that take place over time. I want to also ask you about uh, something I believe you're involved in the National Environmental Research Park. Yes. Could you explain that? What that was. Uh, it was uh, the uh, national import. All the DOE sites, uh, not all, not all, but most of them, uh, were belong to the National Impart Environmental Research Park: Oak Ridge, Savannah River, Hanford, Los Alamos. I think those are the and uh, Savannah River, yeah. And the, the 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 purposes of the park was just to serve as a as places where we could do f f ecological research in different different kinds of ecosystems. So there are scientists at each of those. There were scientists. At the, uh, it was never very as popular at Hanford as it was with the other popular at the other park, partly because the ale reserve had already been set aside, acting as a national. Re 
environmental research park before the other site. And Idaho was also, is also a member. The Department of Energy has probably decided not to, as far as I know, decided not to support that, but have, uh, but did support AO. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, go back to when you first uh, came to work at Hanford, 1960. Mm -hmm. um, had you been here before? I was here, uh, I went to Pullman in 53, and I'd been to Richland. What were your first impressions of Richland? Would, uh, have you thought of it? Well, at the, at the time, I, I thought it was kind of, there's a lot of other places in Washington I'd rather be. <laughs> it was, I think it was uh, in August when Barbara and I, we got here in September, and no, in 53, uh, Barbara and I, drove down to, from Pullman, to uh, Salilo Falls, because I wanted to see Salilo Falls before it got covered up by a dam. And we came, th we, we stopped in Pasco, and it was 112, or <laughs> 112 degrees in the shade. <laughs> and we decided this wasn't a real nice place. <laughs> of course, we'd been at at Indian Springs, Nevada, too. <laughs> so, so what about when you when you came back in 1960? Then what what did you think of the place? Well, uh, I was impressed, really, mainly with the people. Uh, when I worked at the 100F area, on the the first couple of days, I stood by the. 100F reactor and, and thought that uh, maybe in a few years that, uh, that th this reactor would be closed down and that uh, it'd be Russian thistle growing around the edge of it. Uh, the end reactor closed in 1965. So uh, in the five years that I was here, the react F reactor wasn't working anymore. I thought that was probably a good thing. Um, so you worked initially for General Electric. General Electric, yeah. From Patel came in '65. Th then I joined Patel, so I was one of the first people. And so. Um, did you work essentially sort of at different places all over the site? I did. I was on the Ale Reserve at the old Army camp at, at the buildings there for 10 years perhaps. I was at the 331 building. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when I retired, I still worked as part time for, uh, for Battelle, uh, PNNL then. And I mean, in, in other years, uh, I, I worked with the, uh, what was the Norca, Norcus program. It was a, a DOE-sponsored uh, program where faculty and students could, from the campus here, could, could be assigned to PNL and work, and, and I did that for a number of years, too. And many of the graduate students that we had came through the Norcus program to put PNL, uh, and it's, and we had students from all over the country that spent summers here at Hanford, mm -hmm. working on ale. We had uh, graduate students that worked on elk. Did the, the first. Uh, Studies of elk on the Hanford site were done by graduate students. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, people studying uh, small mammals, uh, bald eagles, <coughs> uh, deer, coyotes. Uh, I don't know how many graduate students uh, from University of Washington, Montana, Oregon State, that over the years actually 
got masters and doctorate degrees through through the, the what was then Norcus programs. So it was a, a teaching place as well. Teaching program yeah. too, yeah. Um, wanted to ask you. Uh, President Kennedy visited the site in 1963 to dedicate the end reactor. 63. Do you had any memories? Were you there when he? Was here? No. Uh, uh, I remember when he was here, but I didn't go to the celebration. I think I had. I was probably out of town or maybe assigned to someplace else in the 60s. Um, wonder of the different uh, different kinds of work that you did at Hanford, the different projects you worked on, what was sort of the most challenging um, thing that you worked on and, and maybe the most rewarding part of your work? Oh, I think probably the most uh, most uh, rewarding part was the te working with students, working with the actual people, and then I think the the day that the arid land reserve reserve appeared on the map. Sure. Mm -hmm. That was probably. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. And what about the most challenging aspect of your work? Was anything that? Was oh, I never found them particularly challenging. It just took hard. This I think. Uh, I think one of the professors at, uh, at at Washington State told me research is about ninety nine percent perspiration and one percent inspiration. So it's work, but it's uh, enjoyable. And it's, there's always some satisfaction in in learning something you didn't know before, no matter how small it is. I, I, did, I don't imagine it's nearly as important as somebody that discovered a cure for cancer or heart disease or something. But it, it, it's uh, it's pleasant when you when you can just discover something that you didn't know before. Right. Um, <clears throat> so when you look back at your years working at Hanford, overall how would you assess Hanford oh, as a I place to work? I think it's been a good ride. Uh, I, I liked teaching, but I enjoyed the research more. Are more of a researcher rather than a teacher, mm -hmm. but uh, I think they they belong together. Is there any um, anything that event or incident or something that happened while you when you're working at Hanford sort of stands out in your memory that? Oh, I think. I think the uh, thing that's, that uh, probably uh, stands out not in a, is not in a in a good sense, but it was the uh, when Les Eberhardt 